And the thing with this mRNA, the one with the short twenty eight chain, is that uh, they are very low efficient, low, very they have very low uh, efficiency of the like of transcription time. In other words, they are translationally dormant molecules or complexes, and they are translationally dormant because all they can interact with is the CTE, is a proton called CTEB. They have a sequence called like uh, upstream of the twenty eight chain. And it's in, in its turn, it interacts with a proton called machine, which interacts with another proton called the pipe, which interacts with the cap. And you have a stable, another degraded, like stable structure. So this mRNA is definitely not degraded. It's a stable structure, but it is translationally dormant. Dormant meaning uh, sleepy or uh, hidden, uh, inactive. Okay, then upon something, upon some stimulus, uh, usually phosphorylational of the CTEB, which interacts with another protein called CTSF, I intently do not uh, 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 say what each of these abbreviations stands for, because the lab wanted to give kind of the overall uh, um, mechanism for the CTE, not go into the structure and function of each of, of and every protein. Okay, so CTEB interacts with CTSF, which recruits TAP. We have mentioned this enzyme at, uh, at five or six slides back. This is the um, poly A elongation enzyme. This is the one that synthesized that synthesized the uh, poly A chain. So when it recruits the poly A chain length decreases very sharply and very rapidly. And then it can interact a long poly A chain as opposed to a short poly A chain and can interact with a PABCI set of proteins, which now let's skip a few more steps, interact with a couple of additional adapters and eventually recruit the small ribosomal subunit, which is the starting point for transcription. So this will be a, a, a translation, translationally active complex. Summarize this, some mRNAs reach the cytosol with a short poly A tail, which is a translationally dormant um, complex. And upon stimulus, phosphorylation CTEB, some cascade of events occur that ends with the recruitment of the, of the uh, ribosomal subunit, the small ribosomal subunit, and then translation starts, uh, and the mRNA is transcribed, translated into a protein. And the most classical example of the in, in which this uh, mechanism happens is an ovum cell, a uh, cabin sheet. So before fertilization of the ovum cell, it has a lot of mRNAs with a short poly A in the cytosol. And upon fertilization, there is a correlation of the CTEB. And all of a sudden, lots of things are being translated into a lot of mRNAs are translated into the protein. Lots of things happen uh, all at once. And that, yes? This is the this is the state. You need to have a, a long poly A that, that indeed interact with the PABCI and uh, and, and give rise right to this translationally active complex. Okay, so ovum cell is one classical co uh, example. The next one is thymus cell or or neuronal cell. Are becoming also a classical example. So an increasing line of evidence points to that thymus cells, um, or specifically synaptic strand coming also, as in ovum cell case, result for, uh, from translationally activation of mRNAs, which are stored in the cytosol, in the postsynaptic side, with a short poly A tail, and upon something, uh, increased activation, increased transmission to the thymus for, uh, I don't know, exposure to a neurotransmitter, uh, a long and current exposure, um, the poly A tails of some mRNAs tend to be elongated and hence they can start to translate them. So it's proteins which might serve as the molecular basis for the morphology changes that happen in the postsynaptic side. Okay, so synapses or the needed spines can, can be become bigger or smaller. And 
which was also shown that you can change the neurophysiological characteristics, explaining the balance between the different channels that are there, that are there is another thing that, that, that is affected by uh, cytoplasmatic polio in neurons. Uh, 
bind or interact with the PABPI protein goes like that, which recruits the small uh, subunit of the ribosome, and hence this mRNA with the short folio chain will no longer be active. Okay, in this case, usually you will either have a decoupling of the pi protein and then degradation, or transport to the to the exosome. how it happens, not, not really, I don't know why, I mean, I don't know if it's an effect or if this is what, what it turns out. I don't know if it's an eff necessary effective uh, way to do it, but a polio chain with a short, uh, sorry, an MRNA with a short polio chain will, will a lot of the time also be recapped. And I'm not sure if the details are known, <coughs> maybe if I get uh, some stabilizing interactions, it will factors that bind to the polio chain and the decapping and decapping and sorry and capping or cap means stabilizing factors. And so when these are gone also the decapping is induced. Right? Yeah that's it. Okay, so um, for things for, for genes that are uh, degraded in this fashion in the deadenylation pathway, which is a great structure of genes, it's a fixed fashion of genes. So there is a positive association between the rate of synthesis or the rate of, of transcription and the rate of degradation. So that the higher the transcription, the slower the rate of deadenylation, and hence degradation. So for these genes, if you throw up like expression in a level in function of time, it will be something like that. They are transcribed, transcript, transcribed very, very rapidly and then they are degraded very slowly. And this is because, again, we will not go into the mechanism, but we do know, but we do know it, so this is due to reciprocal or, or stabilizing interactions between initiation factors, so similarly transcription will change from initiation factors, and the stabilizing PABPI, which again is stabilized and uh, stabilizes the MRA. Okay, so and they interact with each other in a positive manner. For some mRNAs, this coupling between transcription and degradation has to be uncoupled. <coughs> it has to be cytotomic. So for these, for some genes, short, which are short with genes, they are very, they are in a stressing curve in which they have a very, they can indeed uh, transcribe in a very fast way, but then they are also degraded quite rapidly. And the thing that uncoupled between the two is that they contain a sequence which is called for the exosome. So in this kind of pathway, they bypass the, the slowly happening, the slowly happening deadenylation pathway. So again, if they had the sequence called for the exosome, um, um, they will be you know, act very actively and, and rapidly degraded by the exosome. Okay, in this time mRNA has to have the red curve because uh, you know, they are uh, synthetic cyclins, it has to be transcribed and then clear off from the cell very rapidly, also isothymic, also in some way can produce it. Okay, so these are the three degradation pathways in the cytosol, and we will see about them later through them. And this is actually where we will end the chapter about Post-transcription of the modulation, we will just mention uh, that there are mRNA surveillance mechanisms all through the, the life of an mRNA that prevent translation of improperly processed mRNA. And actually, not only prevent translation, but also decrease uh, degradation. And also localization.
addition of the one that came with the reduction of proteins in a specific region within the cytosol. This is some mechanisms exist um, that in this specific transcription in one part of the cell and not in the other is not. Okay, so we went through the modifications that the mRNA undergo in the nucleus when it's away from the cytoplasm and in the cytoplasm. And this is where we end this chapter. So continuing with the same point, which I tried to emphasize when talking about cytoplasmatic polyadenyl making in neurons, I would now like to show you uh, a few results from the article, which we skipped because of the Cerut class, uh, which called RNA splicing capability of like neuron dendrite, and which try to establish that RNA alternative splicing occurs as far away from the soma, far away from the nucleus, at the, at the very end of the dendrite, at the synaptic site. So I will show that it's two experiments and one functional or computational one. Let's actually start with this one. Okay, so this is the slide that we, that we went through together in, in the class, which uh, describes the different small nuclear RNA, which are part of the cytosol, and we do that with two inputs. And they are, as we said, they are worked with additional layer of, of proteins that all together form the splicing. So what they did in the, in the, in the paper is change the human label against different patterns of the splicing in different stages of the splicing. So each time uh, after, after the plant, the splicing promotes the first transcript, transcript which is later derived from the cell, so it has the first, the, the, the A complex or the B side complex and so on. So they change against several patterns of this complex in neurons, in cultured neurons. This is a cultured cytoplasma neuron. And again, more specifically, they identify a, 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 few, a few dots. It's a, it's a sort of a molecule that you can scan with. And then they got positive signals from the soma, which is not surprising, but also from the dendrite, from the far end of the dendrite, which is surprising because the splicing pattern is classically monotonous, so it, it shouldn't be there. So the approach was to each time see if they can co-label, see both uh, proteins of the same type of the neuron, um, which is done by staining against one factor, then staining against another factor, and each time take a photo and then uh, overlap them together so that the green and blue color and red color fields were orange or yellow, and this is where the color collides. So this is some vector which they say or granules appears in the image which should represent sites in the, in the far end of the dendrite uh, as co-localization of the different sites against several Okay, as we said, the cytosome also includes RNA molecules, SM RNA. So they also stain against RNA, which is, a, I think, a bit more tedious uh, experiment. So they stain against the group one SM RNA. So not the one that binds to the, uh, to the left side of the, to the exon and, and the exon. And again, they see a signal of the dendrite. So one criticism about this paper, you see a very clear and, and obvious signal of the soma, but in order to see the signal of the dendrite, you have to increase the sensitivity of the, of the signal uh, really tremendously, up to the level where most people don't work. Pe people uh, have to, I don't know, push the button uh, of, uh, this high to, to increase sensitivity to usually state that they don't have a signal. It sort of really depends on how much you see in the background, but right? outside of the <coughs> And indeed, they, they, their figures and things are, are clear enough to say that there is something in the, uh, in the cytosol in the far end of the dendrite, but still they might, it might be unspecific staining or, I don't know, maybe some of the same, same molecule pushed to the outside membrane of the neurons or, so, or things like that. So in order to do this, the bill of this criticism is they not only showed size images but also try to prove functionality of the splicisome in, uh, in dendrites. And for that, they built a construct, a construct that is very easily spliced, and they 
the Hebrew is called Shrub. In is very right and only very right. There is actually digestive neurons which uh, kick off the stomach. And then you have an experimental system where only have a dendrite. So you can you can uh, uh, keep this dendrite alive and functional for several hours, I think. Okay, and then they deliver the construct into the dendrite. <coughs> you know, anything that happens in the system has to be due to the dendrite because the stoma is no longer there. Okay, and then after incubating the construct maybe the dendrite for a couple of hours, they extract the itself again and and sequence it. And, and examine the modification to its structure. And what we see here is a, is a mapping, is a map of the different molecules, the different products that were uh, uh, extracted within this vessel. And all of them aligned, this is, this is named the potassium of a potassium level, and they are all aligned to the intron-exon junction and to the exon-intron junction, which are the two zero points. They claim that there is a, an enrichment of these products, which are correctly flagged products of this construct, right here and right here, near or accurately at the zero point. And they even give a number for a statistic out of them, which how significant. I mean, because when you look at it with your eyes, it does not look very good. What they did is uh, assume uh, equal distribution of the, of the product along the construct, and upon this assumption, if this is your null hypothesis, then you can reject it with a tremendous p-value, with just three values, so, so this has to be a real result in which the construct was uh, flagged to engage with the space of one kinase in the case of the dendritic site. Again, one criticism is that I don't think that using equal or uh, equal distribution as the null hypothesis here, as the hypothesis to be rejected, is a valid one because this construct as any other construct has some naturally sensory point of flanking which can occur. And so, right, I think that by, by using the equal distribution as the null hypothesis, they actually gave a much lower estimation to p-value than what should really be, and by that, bias the effect was a, a much more significant one that, again, that really should be calculated in this experiment. Um, okay, not only all this is better without the results, some newer uh, experiments, newer studies are now trying to, starting to be led, or the deal with dendritic about molecular theory techniques and it's parallel to the ninth chapter in the textbook. <coughs> right. So when we try to investigate a gene or the other things we recognize as genes, they can use biochemistry tools <coughs> Use overexpression address 
question, focus of question of Kantian with Engel and Luke Martin. And so these are kind of the three, the three levels or the three bunch of tools that I would recommend you. Now, when I, when a study moves from the up, from up to bottom in this diagram, it represents the classical humanist approach. Classical like Mendel. Uh, the classical uh, genetic approach in which you find an organism, you find some phenotypes, you study its phenotypes, and then you try to isolate the genes that underlie these phenotypes. And upon DNA cloning, you can then produce large amounts of proteins, and, hence, and then you can study the structure of the protein, the function of the protein, and so on, and try to link between the, the several la layers using this approach. When you move from bottom upward in this diagram, this would be the reverse genetic approach, which is nowadays due to all the genome databases, databases that exist, is, is possible, in which, okay, you, you start with the protein or with the gene, because, I don't know, maybe it has an analogous Region to another protein that was found interested or important uh, to a functional neuronal uh, uh, functional way, and then you start with it, induce some mutation, insert it into an element, and then look for a phenotype. So you change the genome, you know, you change the, the set of proteins that are produced from the gene, and then look for a phenotype. So this would be the reverse genetic approach. And so this was as a way of introduction. Way of introduction, we will see, we will focus on some steps along this diagram. Some of them enabled us to move from bottom to up, and some from uh, up to bottom. And this uh, first unit, uh, the reverse genetic approach again, uh, do, you have, do you have any idea what the role of this would be? Or is it uh, this volume? Clever systems in this respect. So, for instance, uh, I brought an example of the retina of the Rosocula, of the, the fruit fly, which is a good experimental system. And, and now we will be surprised to use the generation. And use the generation is a zoom disease, right? It's, it's a bunch of diseases, Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's, M a ALS, MS, and so on and so forth. And still, how come it is it that the retina of the Rosocula uses 10 years of experimental system or animal? or um, not an animal model, but an organ model of this disease phenomena. So you identify proteins in which, um, which you think, which you have good re reason to believe that they will play a role in neuronal, in neural degeneration um, for several reasons. For their having a, a motif that deals with uh, ion transmission, <coughs> for having a motif that, um, uh, or have vision without the neurons and so on. And then if you induce in the retina mutations and cells start dying, I mean, this would be a phenotype that might, you know, might be linked to neural degeneration because they are neurons. Um, and so sometimes we do analogies, you know, we do, uh, we do links between different systems and different proteins. And, and so you always have, I mean, not always, but usually people do systems that are easy, that are where you find relatively easy to find phenotypes. So in the retina of the zocula, you can do just scan a new population of the zocula of the fly, and then each time the switch is under the binocular, it's the retina is destroyed or it's, um, and if, if there is some more subtle, hidden phenotype that most usually, or most commonly you would, you would look for. And so then you say, okay, sometimes people fi find phenotypes for animals that they predict 20 years back. And with this, you know, we have to look at the right person for this. So, do you want to ask something? Yes. Okay. So this is the basic diagram, and we'll focus on some specific types in it. And just as before, the overview, let's start with some basic concepts in genetics, <coughs> basic terms. So alleles are the different forms, the different variants of a gene. And the natural has so many different forms of a gene. Not necessarily a mutation, but all, all of us have different alleles for a given gene. Genotype is a particular set of alleles, so a particular set of forms, specific uh, forms of genes that an individual has. And a phenotype is 
that particular set of physical attributes or traits that the individual has. And it starts with its, its phenotype is the consequence of the genotype. So again, the genotype gives rise to the trait. The set of alleles gives rise to the set of sociological, behavioral, whatever, characteristics of the normal individual. Okay, wild type is a term that's used as uh, to, to denote the normal, non-mutated allele. But I just said that some alleles happen in the population naturally, and even some alleles, some genes have more than two alleles. So what would be the wild type? The one with the higher frequency of phenotype. Third opinion. Mutation is a, is a term that's usually reserved for uh, cases in which an allele is known to have been newly formed. So if yesterday there was no mutation in the RNA and today there is, and the new generation of organism we have a mutation and, and some new allele appears, then this is what biologists will usually say will call mutation. And a mutagen is any agent that cause or promote this kind of a, a, of a heritable change in the DNA of the RNA. Any agent that, that induces mutation. Okay, we will go over uh, uh, the two concepts of analysis and mutations to identify enzyme genes, <coughs> then three different methods in the lab to, uh, to perform DNA cloning. What we can do with the, with the fragments that we will introduce in the DNA cloning step, which will be discussed in characterization and, and usage of the DNA fragment. And we will end by saying a word about genomics, which is a, is a new, relatively a new field of research in which you can ask genome-wise questions through sequence genetics. additional changes in genetics to call for the next slide. So copious groups of cellular organisms are diploid, which means that they have two copies from each gene, from each chromosome. And with diploid animals, you have two kinds of mutations, which is, you know, that, which is, uh, which does not exist, which do not exist in, in creatures with just one copy of each gene. So diploid animals can carry identical alleles, can have two copies of the same allele. And in that case, they will be homozygous to the gene, homozygous to the allele. Or they can carry different alleles, in which case they will be heterozygous to the gene. So this is the, the first unit, additional group. So in recessive mutations, the individual must be homozygous for the mutant, for the mutant allele, sorry, show mutant phenotype. Okay, in the dominant mutation, the individual has to carry one mutant and one, and one wild type allele, and hence be hetero heterozygous to the, uh, to the gene. Okay, and this table summarizes the different genotype and phenotype uh, 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 states that are possible in a diploid creature. So, if this is the case in the genome, that you have the two, two copies of the wild type and you will have the healthy, normal wild type uh, phenotype. If the mutation is a dominant mutation, it's enough for the, for the organism to have just one copy of it, so the mutant phenotype will appear. If the mutation is recessive and you have just one mutation, just one copy, then the other copy will fix the first one and will compensate for the first one and will still have still the wild type phenotype. But if you have two copies, you will not have anything that will, that will fix it, and you will have the mutant um, phenotype. So these are diploid, mutant, wild type, dominant recessive mutation. And due to their characteristics, so recessive mutations usually result from the inactivation of an affected gene, and not the gain of a function, but the loss of a function, inactivation, which leads to a partial and or incomplete set of functions. So if this mutation calls inactivation of any product that will be produced from this part of the genome, that's okay, that's still okay, because this one can fix it. So if you have a loss of function, so I will say that in other words, recessive mutations are usually a loss of function. In a post dominant mutations, which are usually an ectopic, uh, ectopic means out of, out of uh, in, in the wrong time, in the wrong place. 
some exotic expression of a theme or deep enhancement uh, for the theme with this mutation to be used. For the dominant mutation, you may increase the activity of the encoding protein to create new activity scenes or lead to inappropriate spatial or, or sexual partner expression. So if this mutation causes this protein to have a, a, a bell function, a capsule function, a gain of function, so whatever this one, this protein does, the matrix does to make this intense mutation, this will be dominant. And that's where one reservation is that the dominant mutations also may lead to loss of function or be uh, uh, the source of, of loss of function, as usually the case for recessive mutation, when both alleles are required for normal function. So some genes, it's, it's um, a quantity thing that you have to have both copies, and then even if one in Dennis and Apple want to be detected, and if the other one cannot be that, I don't know, for instance, with the right amount of uh, uh, reactants that have to be produced, that have to be uh, transformed into product, so indeed you, you might switch it or you can switch it. Okay, and, and as the classical genetics tries to link between mutations, dominant recessive mutations in the genome and certain phenotypes, physiological phenotypes, and also <coughs> in neurobiology we have this field that does exactly the same for uh, tries to link between um, genes and behaviors, a field that's re sometimes referred to as psychiatric genetics. This is just one journal that that represents this field, but many other exist. Okay, this is this next this last slide is for the break, which gives you a very elegant system to try to delineate or to determine the hierarchy or the order between two components in a cellular pathway. So let's go like this. <coughs> so let's assume that you have two genes, and you know that they are members in a specific cellular pathway. And some preliminary experiments show that a mutation in gene E gives repressed reporter expression. Reporter is any molecule that you can set its level, replicant E, for instance, might be a reporter in, in an experiment, and then it automatically gives you the endpoint of the pathway or nearby the endpoint of the pathway. Okay, so you can track its, uh, its expression and uh, give you the, the outcome of the pathway. So a mutation in A, so say a, a, a separate preliminary experiment, gives repressed reporter expression, which means that A visually on a physiological condition is an activator, because when you shut it off or, or uh, interrupt with its proper functioning, it gives uh, refreshed expression or penetration. Okay, then it is <coughs> an activator. It has to be positively correlated, positively linked, linked with the reporter. And also, let's assume that we know that a mutation in a gene in GP gives conservative or high levels of reporter expression, which means that B under healthy normal conditions is a repressor. B has to be negatively linked with the reporter. Okay, so this is what you already know. Now we induce a double mutation in both A and B at the same cell at the same time. And we have two possible scenarios for this experiment, and each one has just one possible interpretation. So if the outcome is that the double mutation in A and B gives repressed reporter expression, so when you produce, when you induce a double mutation, if this is, if it's the outcome of the of the third of the of the A gene, because the outcome is the same as the, the single mutation for the A gene, so it has to be that A is more directly linked with the reporter, lower downstream in this cascade, and hence B has to be higher in the hierarchy or or still before A. So this is ha this is the only possible order of events. You can try to to try to switch it and see that the other preliminary experiments will not work in this case. And now how do we know that B is an in in inhibitor of A? Because we know that a single B mutation gives conservative reporter. So if you if you inhibit B, A becomes higher and activates uh, the reporter in a conservative way. So from the single mutation, we learn that it has to be a negative inhibition between B and A. And this will be the relationship between B, A, and the reporter. If the second scenario is 
the one we get, we use the W dash in the end, we use the GDP for the expression. So it has to be the B is directly linked to the reporter because this was the, the outcome of the signal we came from the B. And how we do how do we know that both of them are now integral? Okay, because so we know that B is an integral because the signal we came from in B uh, cause contributes to the reporter expression. Uh, if we go by expression, it continues on this normally on this integral at the threshold of the system in the buffer. And we know that a mutation in A gives us rest to quarter expression. So minus minus is a plus. So A is positively linked to the reporter. And of course, the signal mutation gives, and this is, it has to be the case because the signal mutation in A gives this rest to quarter expression. So, so some of you can really, you know, switch between the order of these two or switch between the plus or minus sign between the rest of the system. See that none other, n no other explanation uh, contributes to these three results. The result of the, of the signal mutation in, uh, experiment in A in B and the W mutation in experiment. Okay. 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 mutation, I mean, any, ch any change, usually proteins are, you know, already optimized, uh, not to switch to the two of our example, and so any, any, uh, any different, any change between the two, they will reduce their activity, and by no means lack of example will change the other, for the other scenarios, which is uh, for the, for increasing function, um, of the mutation One example, uh, and if, and if you read more and more biology with good biology papers, you'll see that other other similar systems exist. Let's say you're pursuing fluid control.
you mentioned a couple of things. Uh, Between these two nucleotides to give rise 
square eight x double standard zero. Let's plug it in here. Now. Promote the end to end joining of the one of the restriction segments and the vector zooming. Vector zooming. There are several kinds of vector monitoring. And the most the most common one we can learn are a flat wheel. Flat wheels are circular double stranded wheel rails. There, uh, there are separate chromobacteria, chromosome, and DNA. So they are naturally occurring in, in a bacteria and it is in E. coli. And, and here in the last years they have been modified tremendously and the structure is really not what was uh, originally was there to allow for an easy walk with them and, and to a versatile walk with them with different to incorporate different DNA fragments into them. And again, different structures for this metroid exist, for this flat wheel exist. But the principal regions that each flat wheel will have are the following three ones. So first of all, we will have a sequence where the DNA replication is initiated by the host cell enzyme. A plasmid is a, is a parasite in the sense that it cannot uh, replicate itself and it relies or it will slave the uh, machinery machinery of the host cell. So this is where the machinery of the host cell will start replicating. It doesn't have to have a sequence that is effectively bind, uh, binded by this machinery. The second principal region will be a sequence that calls for a gene or it is called for a protein that uh, induced some resistance of this flat wheel or of the cell that will host this flat wheel to something, to some stimulus uh, to of the resistant environment. So in this case, in this example, we see M5 stimuli, epithelium resistance. Epithelium is a kind of an uh, antibiotic, and antibiotics kill, kill bacteria, but if a bacterium will have good uh, plasmid in it, it will have a protein that allows it to cope uh, with the epithelium and actually survive this exposure. And any other selection marker, usually the drug resistant gene, will also exist. So it's, it's called a selection marker because the next step will be to introduce this flat wheel into a population of bacteria, and any bacteria that will not have this epithelium resistant gene will die, and which will leave more space and which will allow only for the epithelium resistant bacteria to grow. And you will see why we want to start with this in the next slide. Okay, so this is the second principal region a flat wheel will have. The third one is the region into which the exogenous DNA, the restriction fragment, can be inserted. And it usually has sites for restriction enzymes from, from a variety of restriction enzymes, again, just to allow for a more versatile uh, use, usage in the lab. <coughs> we can have one flat wheel uh, which will serve you to incorporate one DNA fragment and also another, and a third one because it's a different restriction type <coughs> that can be used accordingly. Okay, so these are the three regions. And the structure of the plasma allows us for an effective uh, incorporation of the DNA fragments to this, so this is the outcome of this step. And the next one is to deliver this plasma into host cells. And this is done by several, again, several protocols exist. You can either the, 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 the culture, uh, the other calcium chloride, so different, different protocols exist, but the end point is the flat wheel is inserted, inserted into some of the bacteria, which usually actually is very no, uh, small minority of the bacteria. But we don't have to worry about that because any cell that does not have this uh, flat wheel will die upon exposure to a bacteria. And the ones who have the plasmid will be resistant to epithelium and will then survive and will grow. And the endpoint product will be a huge colony of bacteria that each and every one of them has the plasmid. Okay, so the initial DNA fragment is replicated in a colony of cells into a large number of identical proteins. So 
this was how we performed the game actually by the combination uh, by the combination of the methods. And we next would like to characterize it and use it for the game. Position you will have the A, B, and D, and so on. In each position, you will have the single pick. 
And when you read these sticks from beginning to end, this is actually the sequence of the DNA that was cloned. And again, I, we, we keep uh, uh, describing this method because, because it's a relatively an intuitive one. The more complicated one is, as I said, use different chemistry, gives you the same result in the pattern, maybe more reliable, but, but the principles are always the same. And uh, this is just to give you a taste of how we know the sequence of, any, of something that we can't even see in the first place. So this is the most classical uh, method that exists. Now, with this being said, I would like to say more things to give you the sequence of events of what I've just explained. I could do that for 20 minutes. So I'm going to reduce it to this. A short radio-labeled primer is annealed to the single-stranded DNA to be sequenced. The DNA serves as a template for in vitro DNA synthesis. The DNA primer mixture is split into four separate tubes. DNA polymerase and a solution of DNTPs are added to each tube. One of the four 2 prime, 3 prime dideoxy NTPs or DDNTPs is mixed into each tube at a concentration 100 times lower than the DNTP concentration. DNA polymerase uses the DNTPs to elongate the primer DNA. The occasional incorporation of a DDNTP terminates the polymerization reaction since the absence of a 3' hydroxyl blocks addition of the next nucleotide. The DDNTPs are incorporated randomly, resulting in terminated fragments of different lengths. The terminated fragments from each of the four reactions are denatured and separated by size using gel electrophoresis. The gel is auto-radiographed in order to visually detect the labeled DNA fragments. The resulting ladder is read from bottom to top. This represents the complementary sequence of the original DNA template. are interested in. So some, one example would be of insulin, for instance, which 
there's a, a regret for some uh, disorders or, or, um, or conditions. And so insulin, for instance, is, a, is usually produced by inserting a kilos of DNA fragment into an animal system. And in, th in this case, it's not a bacteria, but an animal system. It's in usually in it's done in feces. And it's done in an animal system because insulin, for instance, undergoes several post-translational modifications in coagulations, phosphorylations, and so on. And so the bacteria will not have these replicators. And so you have to move to an animal excretion system. And then the protein is isolated and purified from the system, and you can use it for any preferred that you like. Uh, and more, e more simpler cases, for instance, are the neuronal uh, growth factors, for instance, which are again used as, um, as, as drugs in some conditions. It is used in, in, a, in a bacterial or is synthesized in a bacterial expression system in which the long DNA fragments were uh, delivered. So these are just some examples of uh, what we do with long DNA fragments. removed from this chapter, so my apologies. And we will now go to the last point, which, uh, rep which relates the uh, field of genomics, which is the genome-wide analysis of gene structure uh, of expression. Okay, so a very dramatic, a very large upscaling of the synthesis reaction with GLPSOM enabled us to sequence gradually and slowly, fragment by fragment, the, the whole genome, uh, get the, the full human genome, and also for other organisms to have full genomes, uh, mainly for animal models in science, but definitely uh, not only, also animals that run wild in, the, in Africa. So, um, and for humans, for instance, we have more than 20,000 genomes that are already sequenced and are publicly available. Um, and you can then ask tons of questions that measure the similarity <coughs> genomes of different living beings, and so on. And this serves, or this was a field of basic science, but also of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the science that studies diseases. And one example that show or that emphasizes the use of this approach in the disease is the following one, a very nice story. So, and so it starts with NF1, which is a human gene, and it was found to be associated with neurofibromatosis. So this is a very uh, um, a harsh syndrome, which is also called the Edgerton syndrome, and which we have large protruding bumps from the peripheral tissue. Uh, okay, so it's just to say that some association between the two, which is no mechanism was no, was yet known, but some association in the cases in the genes was associated with this syndrome. In parallel, uh, we have this approach showed that originally in NF1 protein was discovered or, uh, a considerable homology with a yeast protein called IRA. Okay, so we have just moved from studying genome, which is quite harsh, to studying yeast, which is extremely easy. In yeast, IRA is a gap, is a GPTA accelerated protein. This was very easy to, to just go to big population of yeast and try and just perform the right experiments and you can just quite, quite rapidly come to the conclusion that for IRA is a gap. And we mentioned the GPT accelerated protein. In the IRA case, it's, it's a type monomer NG protein. And the next step was, was to show that NF1 was also discovered to be uh, a gap. And then several medications were designed based on this conclusion. Okay, I would just like to show what do we mean by originally the NF1 protein was discovered to have considerable homology with the yeast IRA, just again, just to get a taste of what do we, what do we mean by, by homology with gene protein sequences. So we are now looking at the sequence, the amino acid sequences of NF1, which is the human gene, the black, and the purple right here is, is the yeast IRA gene. The yellow marks denote identical amino acids, so it's true by position, and the red, Also, the homophobic, 
And this is like a clear sign, right? The deliberately you know, dropped off any calculation of how the model is conceived and perceived, then you can just uh, uh, look it up with your eyes and see that you know, a lot of the lack of gradient value is aligned. And this dot right here, okay, so this aligned with, with the product of an algorithm named graph. It works locally. It looks for local alignment. And so the sunshine field it gets should denote regions that exist in this field but not in this field. So actually it's the other way around. So the sunshine field uh, gets in the in the yield field and sunshine gets in the in the yield field. Okay, so after after finding local alignment, you can measure the, the global alignment, global local alignment to this region and you do it uh, very significantly to this degree. Actually, usually the way we find uh, consensus differential and summit that we we saw when we uh, discussed floating matrix, and we do so by aligning between floating with different matrix but similar ones, and you can find the, the uh, similar function. You find uh, the, the matrix and underline this function, and the sequence or the consensus difference, which can be calculated. By the same species or different species. And so, a comparison of related sequences can, uh, from different species, can give clues to evolutionary relationships among proteins. This is one where you, you can measure evolutionary defects between species. And this is just a case about this approach, the, the genomic semantic between two approaches. Another thing that is used. Less and less these days because of the sequencing evolution, but still, uh, is a bunch of methods uh, that globally referred to as microarrays, and these are also these also use uh, the known DNA fragments, or I would say like that they are designed based on the sequences gathered in cloning DNA. So also microarrays are the ones that were uh, uh, that Jackson was enabled using DNA cloning. Now that we have the genomes of so many so many genes, we can track scans of genomes and try to identify novel genes. Not all, I mean, not all the fragments in the genome that we know in the first place are genes. And this can be done by uh, algorithms that scan the genome and look for specific regions. Okay, all the regions, the region that we can read, all the way through the triplet because this is genomic uh, code and so on. Okay, when we try to design such genome of, uh, of bacteria, it performs quite well. It identifies 90% or more of the, of the known genes in the genome, and it has very small number of false positives. And it's because these bacteria, bacteria have very few intro gene maps. And so indeed the features are you know, coherent and, they, and the, the genes are much more structured. And this is not the case in the human genome, in which, as you mentioned while discussing the current expression, genes have intro genes, they look pink and green, and excellent. And so if you try to read a gene all the way from the beginning to end in triplets, you will not be able to do so. But the algorithm has to work in a much more fragmentized manner, in a much more localized manner, and you must still somehow decipher and, 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 <coughs> and uh, conclude that these two axons and zero are part of the same gene. And this is sometimes quite hard to, to conclude. And so this, this, these algorithms, I think, they uh, still do not you know, give I mean, h help of what we know about the human genome. But still using these algorithms, this was how researchers came with the number that perhaps you heard, that the human genome has about 35,000 genes in its genome. And this is only when you perform some nice scanning with these algorithms that have that uh, number. And for 10,000 of these 35,000 genes, you, you can think of groups so we came with the number that for now is the one is the wrong number, something between 20 and 25,000 genes the human genome has. Uh, and again, there's actually more that we think exist there, but we've ne still never seen, never saw 
because first of all, we see the structure that several uh, several observations in our own lines we uh, together evidence for for RNA molecules, evidence for sodium sodium plasma catalysis, and so on. If I want to get the statistics, there are different complexities. Even the slight variance that we see in, in this one here, that I see in this table, and then there is also the the, the sequence changing. Sequence of the unit ATP. Uh, so it's a, uh, it's a nice to hear that okay, the axons of the ATP gene are marked in red, and sometimes there are some overlap with other axons in the sequence, and they will be in the orange brown there. Okay, uh, sorry. So uh, this sequence is absolutely compared as in the genes, and then you see that this is the first axon of the ATP gene, then the second one, and you have a ring chain right here, another axon. These are the, the three genes that are linked together with the slight change.
Energy is required. 